Welcome to our Sabbath School class. My name is Robert Blaze and I'll be studying the scripture with you. And I'm so excited because this quarter we're going to be studying the book of Daniel. We're going to find out more about this impressive character. We're going to find more about the prophecies and we're going to learn more about God right here on ADTV. Welcome back to Amazing Discovery Sabbath School class. I'm glad you joined us and I pray you've been blessed this week. I have been and I pray that as we study the scripture today that you will also be blessed. And so before we begin, let us pray. Father, we come to you today knowing full well our unworthiness. Father, we know that you are great, you are amazing and so patient toward us. I pray that at this time you will bestow your Holy Spirit upon us so that as we study the scripture we may be guided, we may be directed as to what your will is. I ask also that you empty me and that you also fill me with a double portion of your spirit, Lord, that as I speak I may speak your words and not mine. And I also ask that you forgive our sins, Lord, that you cleanse us from all iniquity and unrighteousness and anything that is unlike Jesus, that we may be more and more like your son. Thank you, Father, for being so good to us. And I pray this in the name of our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness, Jesus. Amen. So before we begin chapter 6, I'd like to review chapter 5. As we will be um, diving today, we will notice some parallels or rather some contrasts from last week. And so we studied from arrogance to destruction and we were introduced to Belshazzar. Belshazzar was a young king who lived according to the dictate of his heart, whatever his sight he got. And of course, he didn't care about the consequences, but when judgment came at his door, when the judgment was pronounced against his kingdom, there was nothing he could do. He was found wanting in the balance because though he knew so many things, though he knew so many things about God, about the life of his grandfather, and about Daniel, he didn't do anything about it. He was found wanting. He had knowledge about God, but he didn't desire to really know him and to do something with that knowledge. And so in the night of drunken orgy, God took the kingdom from him and gave it to the Middle Persian Empire, the Silver Kingdom of Daniel chapter 2. We also discovered that as far as we know, Daniel is the only, uh, the only person, the only character that survived this takeover. We don't know what happened to anybody else. Babylon fell, but Daniel survived. Just as at the end time, there will be a spiritual Babylon and only spiritual Daniels will survive. Today's lesson actually picks up immediately after the events of Daniel 5. What is the title of our lesson this week? It is from the lion's den to the angel's den. And our memory text is from Daniel 6.4. So let us turn to Daniel chapter 6. We read in verse 4, Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they would find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. The memory text testify of Daniel's incredible integrity, and not only in spiritual things, but in the affairs of this world that he was presiding over. As we look at the text a little later in its context, we'll see both the reason uh, why and the consequences of Daniel's faithfulness. But here's a principle that, a principle that I would like us to, uh, to take um, notice of uh, today. It's found in John 15, 20. So if you turn there, we read in John 15, 20, it says, Remember the word that I say unto you. This is Jesus speaking. The servant is not greater than his Lord, if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. You know, there's 
religious movement today that claim and declare that once you accept Jesus, everything is blessing, everything is prosperity, everything is wealth. And that's not fair. Yes, it's true. These things are there. There are pleasures forevermore, the Lord says. But things are not always like that. Jesus clearly says here that the way he was treated, we can expect the same. In 1 Peter 4, 12 to 14, we read, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you. On, the part, on their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Peter is saying, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if because you're doing the righteous things, people don't like you, that you make enemies, that you go through trials. Jesus did. And you can expect the same. Of course, if you get attacked for doing something wrong, that's a totally different story. And in fact, if you get rebuked, count it a blessing because you get to correct yourself. You get to change, you get to repent, and you get to be more like Jesus. But the point is, faithfulness brings the enemy of all righteousness. Now, as we uh, dive into Daniel 6, I'd like to, as we do, Break it down. So Daniel chapter 6. So in verses 1 through 5, we have again our prologue that sets the story up. In verses 6 through 10, we're looking at plotting. That's right, there is a plot that is being devised. In verses 11 to 17, we have the conspiracy that is being exposed. So let's put conspiracy here. In verses 18 to 24, we have a miraculous deliverance. If you're familiar with the story, you already know what this is about. In verses 25 to 27, we have a proclamation. And finally, in verses 28, we have the epilogue. And so this is the structure that our study this morning will take. Now, it's important to also notice that chapter 6 is the companion of chapter 3 in the chiastic structure of the book. And it also gives us a little bit of an insight into the Middle Persian uh, Empire and its structure and everything. So let's read Daniel 6. Let's begin in verse 1 through 5. We read, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the president and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Several things to point out here. First, the structure of the kingdom. Darius wanted to restructure the kingdom in such a manner that he would be without blame. If something would went wrong, would go wrong, he could point finger. So basically this was the structure. So you had the king that was at the top and you had three president, president one, president two, and president three. One of them was Daniel, right? And these, under them, there was 120 princes. Uh, you can think of them as, as governor over different states. And they would give account to any of these three. But the king thought that Daniel was so awesome and incredible, he actually wanted to put Daniel at the top. I mean, there were already 
you know, reporting back to Daniel, but he wanted to put Daniel at the top here so that everyone would relate to him and he would be over the whole realm. Now that's really interesting when you think about it because who was Daniel? Who was Daniel? Daniel was a slave. He came from a foreign country and not only that, he was the former administrator of the previous empire. It, it makes no sense. If anything, Daniel should have been disposed of, should have been killed along with Belshazzar and all of his people. Or at the very least, he should have been exiled. But instead, Darius wants to put him at the top over the whole realm, over the whole empire. You know, that only makes sense in God's economy. Unlike Belshazzar, who didn't want to have anything to do with Daniel, Darius was able to recognize Daniel's abilities, his integrity, his hard work, and his faithfulness. While Belshazzar wanted to have nothing to do with him, Darius wanted to give him everything, the whole kingdom, the keys to the city, as they say. When they took over, Daniel could have, you know, he, he could have been difficult. He could have been rebellious. He could have become unfaithful and dishonest, but he didn't. In fact, he continued to work in the same manner that he worked before. Why is that? Well, that's because Daniel, his allegiance was not to Babylon, and it was not to Middle Persia. It was not to any earthly kingdom. His allegiance ultimately was to God. It was to righteousness and holiness, so that his work, it didn't matter where he was, it was the same. Wherever he was placed, he did everything he could to properly represent God. Like when we talked in the beginning, righteousness and faithfulness invites the enemy of all righteousness and faithfulness. The other princes and presidents they were, not, they were already not happy with the structure and they were not happy with the idea that Daniel would be promoted and be on top of them. You see, the faithfulness of Daniel was not just in his spiritual life. It, it permeated faithfulness in, in everything else, in his work, in his personal life, his private life, his social life, his family life, everywhere. Daniel was faithful. And you'll hear that word a lot because Daniel was. Daniel was the same everywhere. He was consistent. So when his accusers came and they were looking for dirt on him, they, they just couldn't find anything. They had the Middle Persian Central Intelligence Agency. Nothing. They, they had the Middle Persian Federal Bureau of Investigation. Nothing. They looked at his bank account. Nothing. There was no fault, no error. Even them, they were forced to confess, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel. They tried hard, but they couldn't. This is an amazing testimony to Daniel's character. And that also speaks a lot about Daniel's God. I like what A.T. joined A.T. Jones points out in The Great Empires of Prophecy, page 62. He says here, What a commendation is that for a man of business in public affairs. Think, think what a test it was that was put upon Daniel. Everything that occurred in his daily business was watched and spied upon with the closest possible scrutiny and with a definite purpose to find every fault that could be found. Every document that passed his hand, every item of business that arose in connection with his office, every direction that he gave, even every word that he spoke was watched with the most jealous and suspicious prejudice. Yet, these envious men exhausted every device and every means of information only in vain, and were compelled to confess their complete failure, no fault, and not even an error could be found in Daniel's conduct of the business of the empire. In Daniel 1, we had established that we can be successful and that compromise is not necessary. Here, 
we see that Daniel is full of integrity. He's honest, faithful, he's accurate, and he is without fault in all of his business transaction and dealing. He has good rapport and good reputation even among his enemies. Daniel was an honest prime minister and a faithful prophet of God. What if we were all like that in our businesses? So, what's left? His accuser couldn't find anything, so they resorted to stratagem. They said, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. They would have to trap him. They would have to use his faithfulness against him. That is wicked and devious. Let's keep on reading, beginning in verse 6. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, the, the first thing that I want you to notice is that this is an absolute bold lie. They did not consult everyone. The proof is they didn't consult Daniel because Daniel would not have agreed to that. And Daniel was at the top. They didn't consult him. And most likely they didn't go and, you know, they didn't go to all the, who were they that they said? They said they, they, they went to the governors, the princes, the counselors, the captains. I doubt very much that they went through all that trouble. But it sounds good, right? It sounds good when you have the majority on your side, when everybody agree, you know, it, it gives strength, it gives power, it makes it legit, except the majority is not always right. So they resorted to lie and flattery. They told the king, you know, it, it'd be good for you. You know, everybody's gonna come to you and, and it's almost worshiping you like a god. Sounds really, really good. And the capital punishment to disobey, you die in the lion's den. Fortunately, the, the king was smart, but he didn't see through their plot. He didn't realize what they were really trying to do. And so he signed. And I find interesting that it says that the law of the Medes and the Persian alter it not. It doesn't change. It's almost as if the law is infallible coming from a man who signs it, almost saying that the lawmaker is infallible. You know, only God is infallible, and any man who claims to be infallible claims to be like God. The Bible says that when you claim to be like God, that's blasphemy. Question. What would you do if you were in Daniel's position? The decree just passed. What do you do? You're not allowed to worship your God. If you do, you'll die. What do you do? Signs of the Time, November 4, 1886, paragraph 4. In all cases where the king had a right to command, Daniel would obey. He was willing to obey as far as he could do so consistently with truth and righteousness. But kings and decrees could not make him swerve from his allegiance to the king of kings. He knew that no man, not even his king, had a right to come between his conscience and his God and interfere with the worship due to his maker. And so, as predicted by his accuser in verse 10, we, we read, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Again, a 
few things to notice here, um, and a few questions that might come to mind as well, is first, Daniel's consistency in his prayer life. We read here that he prays three times a day. Good day, bad day, three times a day. He's facing Jerusalem, that's according to his custom, as um, King Solomon in his prayer of inauguration said, if ever uh, they, take, they get taken captive, that they may turn their face toward Jerusalem while praying. So that's basically what he was following. But what really interests me is the fact that it says in, in the last portion, as he did a fourth time. What, what does that mean, as he did a fourth time? Well, it means that the condition around Daniel did not impact his prayer life. It didn't matter what was going on around him, didn't matter what the situation was, he still prayed. A true Christian's prayer life is not dependent on circumstances. It's not motivated by outward events and circumstances. It's consistent. It doesn't matter what's going on. Prayer happens. Too many of us, we become really prayerful when trouble comes, right? Have you ever noticed how, uh, how much people start praying when there's turbulence in the plane? Or um, when the first of the month comes and the bank account is low and people don't know what to do because they have to pay their rent? How prayer suddenly becomes important? Now, I'm, I'm not saying that when, when difficult situations come, we should not redouble our effort. But that shouldn't be the only time we pray fervently. It should be consistent. It was in Daniel's life. Now, for some thoughts here, let's think. It says that Daniel knew that the decree was signed. So, why still do it? Why still pray with the open window? Why not go in the closet? Why not just close the window? Closet prayer is biblical. Jesus says, go pray in the closet, and what you do in secret, your Father will reward in the open. Daniel could have definitely do that. Why not? Why did he not do that? Well, I'd like to read this passage again from the youth's instructor. It says, Daniel prayed more fervently than what is wont, that he who understand the secret working of Satan and his agent would not leave his servant, but would care for him. He prayed for strength to endure the trial. Some may ask, why did not Daniel lift his soul to God in secret prayer? Would not the Lord, knowing the situation, have excused the servant from kneeling openly before him? Or why did he not kneel before God in some secret place where his enemies could not see him? Daniel knew that the God of Israel must be honored before the Babylonian nation. He knew that neither kings nor nobles had any right to come between him and his duty to his God. He must bravely maintain his religious principle before all men, for he was God's witness. Therefore he prayed as was his wont, as if no decree had been made." It would have been a really good political move for Daniel to hide. He would have still practiced his religion. He would have followed the king's decree. He would have been shown to be obedient to the king. But that would have been a poor spiritual decision. He would have basically put the state over his fate. His spiritual life would have been damaged. And it would have meant compromise. It would be subtle, unseemly, imperceptible, but it would have given Satan an edge. Daniel, as well as us, we can't afford to give the enemy any edge. Plus, why would he stop now when prayer was even more important, more needed? Hmm? He knew the consequence, but he would not swerve because he knew that God would not swerve. If he would want to perform his political duties faithfully, he also had to practice his religious duties faithfully. Now there's one more reason, and that's found in Prophets and Kings, and I think that's very important for us. 
page 542. We read, Thus the prophet boldly yet quietly and humbly declared that no earthly power has a right to interpose between the soul and God. Surrounded by idolaters, he was a faithful witness to his truth. His doubtless adherence to right was a bright light in the moral darkness of that heathen court. Daniel stands before the world today, a worthy example of Christian fearlessness and fidelity. Daniel was also conscious of those around him. If he would have compromised, what would it have said about his faith, about him, about God? He needed to be a continuous witness to all those around him, to the Babylonians that were still in the city, that knew him, as well as to the Middle Persians. He needed to be a good witness, and so he could not compromise. People observe. They watch. They look. They see. They <laughs> a lot of people will not have a personal experience with God but they'll be looking at us to make a decision. They'll use us to gauge Christianity. Does it make sense? Is it worth it? Is it legit? They'll be looking at us for these things. Our witness tells a lot about the God we serve. Two verses in Romans. Romans 1 verse 8, speaking to the church at Rome, Paul says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. The Romans' faith was known through the whole world, according to Paul. That was an awesome witness. But then a little later, in chapter 2, verse 24, he also says, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. Faithfulness brings people to God. Unfaithfulness drives people away from God. And so we need to be careful in all that we do. Back to Daniel 6, verse 11, we read, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. There's one thing about faithfulness. It's predictable. People know what's going on. People know if you go to church regularly. They know where you'll be. They know where you sit in church. They know where you are on Wednesday night, on Friday night. They know where you're not. They know these things. Even God in that sense is predictable because God is faithful. Remember it says that Daniel prayed as he did a four time, just like what he did before. His accuser were actually banking on that. They were hoping and, and they knew that he would still do it, even if the decree was passed. That's why they were there spying. That's why they had the decree. That's why they could plan all of this very meticulously. Why? Because they knew Daniel. They knew his character. They knew his faithfulness. They knew he would not swerve. Verse 12. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but make it his petition three times a day. Of course, now that they go back to the king, they first have to establish the fact that the king had agreed to that decree, that he had signed it. And so once the king says, yeah, yeah, we, we did that, we, we passed that, then they proceed in defaming and slandering Daniel. It's very similar to what happened to his three friends in Daniel 3. Look at the way they speak about it. They, they couldn't find any fault in his work, right? So they had to turn to his religion, to his background. So here's what they do. They, they assassinate his character. They say, he's a children of the captivity. He's 
less than us. He regards not the king. He's disrespectful toward you. He regards not the law. He's rebellious. He's an enemy of the state. He's actually a traitor. But this is, this is not a surprise. Actually, it should not be a surprise. The principle, if they persecuted me, Jesus said, they will also persecute you. Remember the things that people were saying about Jesus, his enemies? They were saying he's a, he's a gluten. He's a wine-bibber. He, he has a devil. He makes miracles from Beelzebub. He eats with the publicans and the sinner, basically saying he's guilty by association. He must be a sinner because he eats with them. These are the weapons of Satan. These are weapons of character defamation. But you know, that doesn't phase Daniel. And it shouldn't phase us either. Bible says in Luke 6, 26, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their father to the false prophet. Careful when everybody speaks well of you. It's good to have a few people that don't like you. That tells you that you're at least doing something right. Verse 14, then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. See, the, the king saw his error, and he tried to do everything he could, everything he could to save Daniel. He labored, it says, from day to night. He's, maybe he's bargaining with them. Maybe he's, he's looking, maybe there's a rule somewhere. Maybe there's a law. Maybe there's a way so I can free him. But he can't find anything. And it's the accusers are incredible. I mean, they're relentless and they're so bold in their speech. I don't think they're even reasoning anymore because they're talking to the king to the point of disrespect. But in all that, have you noticed that Daniel doesn't say anything? In fact, since we, we started, there is no record of Daniel saying anything at all. Verse 16. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel." Did you hear the confession of the king? He's, he's a pagan king. Okay, he doesn't worship the God of heaven, but he has faith in the God of Daniel. He declares and proclaims that God is able to save, that he is savior, he can deliver. And he also speaks of Daniel's integrity because he says, whom thou serveth continually. This is, this is the Daniel of witness to the king. That is amazing. I wonder if, if people can say that about us. The God that we serve continually or do we serve him part-time or temporarily or when it's to advantage. And again, Daniel doesn't even say anything. But you know how much we've learned about Daniel so far? And that's not from his mouth. That's from the mouth of other people. That's from the mouth of his enemies. That's from the mouth of the men that he works for. All of these people speaks on Daniel's behalf. That is a powerful witness. Verse 18. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. It's amazing considering who Daniel is. He's a slave. He's from another country. He's from a previous administration. And yet the king is mourning from him. He's agonizing over this. He doesn't want him to leave. 
He wants him alive. He wants to work with him. And I wonder, I wonder what the other people are doing. You know, the accusers? Are they, uh, are they having a party and drinking and boasting and congratulating themselves? Hey, good job. He's gone and we're good. We got away with it. Well, finally, he's out of our way. We can continue the way we want to continue. Verse 19. The king arose very early in the morning and went in haste into the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? The servant of whom? Of the living God. This comes from the mouth of Darius. Again, it, we got to wrap our mind around that. He's acknowledging that this is the living God, the God of heaven. Complete contrast with Belshazzar from last week. Complete contrast. Verse 21. Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den, so that Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. This always amazes me. It says, because he believed in his God. Daniel, because of his faith and his belief, has no hurt. No hurt. But sometimes I, I also ask myself, because this could be read differently. Is it possible that the he who believed actually referred to Darius? That we could read it in such a way as it says, because he, Darius, also believe in his, Daniel's God. Could that also be possible? Prophets and King, page 545, paragraph 2. We read, From the story of Daniel's deliverance, we may learn that in seasons of trial and gloom, God's children should be just what they were when their prospects were bright, with hope and their surroundings, all they could desire. Daniel in the lion's den was the same Daniel who stood before the king as chief among the ministers of state and as a prophet of the Most High. A man whose heart is stayed upon God will be the same in the hour of his greatest trial as he is in prosperity, when the light and favor of God and of man beam upon him. Fate reaches to the unseen and grasps um, and grasp eternal realities. When people ask about Daniel 3, you know, would Daniel do the same thing? Would Daniel not bow? Would he be just, you know, facing the fiery furnace? Would he choose the furnace? Well, chapter 6 clearly proves that he would choose the furnace just as he chose the lion's den. He would prefer to be faithful and die than unfaithful and live. Verse 24. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lion had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den. That sounds a little bit harsh, but let's think about it. They came up with a decree, and they made, they, the decree was signed. That decree said that no man may ask petition from any other man nor God than the king, making, in essence, the king God. They themselves acknowledged by doing this that Darius was their God. They had turned their back from their own religious belief, from their own God. And so, 
who was going to deliver them now? Because the one that they acknowledge as God is now throwing them in the lion's den. The God of Daniel, they refused. There was no God to deliver them. Verse 25. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Who had delivered, who had delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? You see, while the first decree prevented um, freedom of worship, freedom of prayer even, it had to be done in secret, this last decree opens the possibility to pray everywhere. The second decree encouraged freedom of religion in the open. Finally, verse 28 tells us, So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Again, Daniel transcends uh, the reign that he's working for, and he even served for the next king, which was Cyrus. Now, I like the way Uriah Smith and Daniel in Revelation uh, comments on the, the, the decree of Darius. It says, The decree of the king sets forth the character of the true God. He is the creator. All others are without life in themselves. He is steadfast forever. All others are helpless and unavailing. He has a kingdom, for he made and governs all. His kingdom shall not be destroyed. All others come to an end. His dominion is without end. No human power can prevail against it. He delivered those who are in bondage. He rescues a servant from their enemies when they call upon him for help. He works wonder in the heavens and signs upon the earth. And to complete all, he has delivered Daniel giving before our eyes the fullest proof of his power and goodness in rescuing his servant from the power of the lions. How excellent a eulogy of the great God and his faithful servant. Now with, with this section, the biographical section of the book of Daniel comes to a close. Now it doesn't mean that we're not going to learn more about Daniel, but the following chapters will focus more on prophecy. And so we had like the most incredible element of the life of Daniel. But as we conclude today's study, there's a few questions that remains unanswered. And one of those is, why did not God intervene sooner? Why did he allow Daniel to go through all that? I mean, he had many occasions to stop. He could have stopped the accusers. He could have stopped the king. He could have stopped the law. He could have hidden Daniel while he prayed. He could have covered the eyes of the people. But he did not. And the question is, why? Well, prophets and king, we have a little bit of an answer. It says, God did not prevent Daniel's enemies from casting him into the lion's den. He permitted evil angels and wicked men thus far to accomplish their purpose, but it was that he might make the deliverance of his servant more marked and the defeat of the enemies of truth and righteousness more complete. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, Psalm 7610. The psalmist has testified. Through the courage of this one man who chose to follow right rather than policy, Satan was to be defeated and the name of God was to be exalted and honored. What we have here is a little bit of the great controversy in a, in a miniature picture. You see, Daniel's faithfulness, because God did not intervene, intervene Daniel's faithfulness can be demonstrated and witnessed by everyone. 
See the impact it had on the king, the God whom thou servest continually. And then wickedness, the wickedness of the accuser could be fully displayed. There would be no doubt as to what they were saying. It could be clearly seen that they were wicked and evil. The character of Daniel was vindicated. The character of the accusers could be now fully seen and understood. God could be permitted to fully deliver, his character be completely vindicated, and doubt eradicated. Truth and righteousness could be fully demonstrated, witnessed, and appreciated by the whole world. This, in essence, is the great controversy. Satan is accusing God of being unfair. And God has a plan to make the world see and know and understand. 1 Corinthians 4, 9 says, For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. You see, when you fall into trial, don't go to God and ask, why? Why is this happening to me? Why, why aren't you doing anything? Because when that happened, first of all, we shouldn't be surprised, but God is trying to prove something. God is using us to vindicate his character. There is a great controversy that is playing out in my life, in your life, in everybody's life. A choice has to be made. Every choice that we make either vindicate the characters of God or sides us with Satan. We have a choice. We can be like Daniel and be on God's side. Or we can be like the accusers and be on Satan's side. God is today looking to close this great controversy for good. And you and I have a part to play. Let us be like Daniel. Let us choose to be faithful in everything that we do, even if the cost is a lion's den. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Uh, what another incredible story. Daniel, such a faithful man, worthy of emulation. For Father, he emulated Christ. And I pray, Lord, that as we continue to study deeper and deeper as you continue to reveal to us truth and give us understanding. Help us, Father, to be steadfast in our faith, that our integrity may be unmovable, our faith unshakable, that we may stand for truth and righteousness no matter the consequences, knowing full well, Father, that you are able to deliver and to save. But if not, we're still going to follow you, Lord, to the end. Please be with us today, and whatsoever we choose to do, Lord, let it be for righteousness' sake. And I thank you and I pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness. Amen.